So today we're gonna to talk about importing and exporting. Before we do that, make sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. Please, I need all the support I can get. I really appreciate it. So let's jump into it. Exporting jobs. When we export jobs, we import terrorism. Let me explain. A lot of fascist and authoritarian regimes capitalize on discontent among the working class and among economic instability. A lot of authoritarian regimes came out of economic instability. You look at the massive inflation that was happening in the Weimar Republic in Germany. You think about Germany rising as an imperial power in the aftermath of World War I, completely decimated, inflation running rampant, economic insecurity. And it translates even here today. Donald Trump and his cohorts have a grip on the working class, the discontent. We see this around Europe as well. It is not unique to the United States, the rise of authoritarian leaders. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening all of a sudden? Well, it's been a process in the making for quite some time. In the aftermath of globalization, in the aftermath of trade agreements that have decimated the working class, if we could jump to Europe real quick, we see the rise of authoritarian fascists everywhere. We see Erdogan. We, in Eastern Europe, we see, of course, Vladimir Putin, the most prominent one. We see Viktor Orban. We see many of these leaders rising in the ranks. Italy, France, Spain, and even in Spain, just like the Nazis before them, they rise to slowly but surely. Now, this is a country that was once overtaken by fascism. Francisco Franco in World War II. So we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening? Well, you have to convince people that they belong to a unique cause. They share in a collective mythos. They hold the same values as, and beliefs they share the same national heritage and identity. This unites them in a common cause. But how do you strengthen this bond? Well, like Hitler said, you have to unite people against a common enemy. There is no force that unites people quite like hate. Seems paradoxical, but it is true. People are the most united when they're hating another group. The group happens to be the scapegoat in most of these situations, immigrants. In Europe, we're seeing people called Euroskeptics that are mostly right-wing, authoritarian, far-right leaders and supporters. The Euroskeptics do not want to join the European Union, European Union being a conglomeration of countries throughout Europe that have an integrated economy that work together by integrating their economies and by making travel across borderlines easier and more accessible. Their resources more accessible, shared resources throughout the respective countries. Those are the Eurocentric people. These are deemed the elites, the liberals who want integrated communication and cohesion throughout Europe. They want to work together and partner by making more robust economies. So you have the Euro-centric people versus the Euro-skeptic people, the left versus the right. And we can also classify this as the quote-unquote globalist versus the nationalist. When there's globalism, the trade deals, trying to integrate economies, it seems to be, to some people, a zero-sum game. Some people are going to lose, some people are going to win. 
we're going to export labor for a cheaper cost. And a lot of get, this gets blamed on immigrants. The immigrants become the scapegoat. They're taking jobs and they're a outside threat and force that is undermining traditional values, that is undermining our collective heritage and beliefs. And that all said, our very nation and the fabric which holds us all together. It becomes a existential threat. A strong man gets into power and exploits this division, saying it's the immigrants, it's these elites, these trade deals. Now, the discontent of the working class is legitimate. It is true because of these trade deals and this globalization. But what happens is you start convincing people that the rule of law doesn't matter anymore, that these people have shafted you for so long and so hard and have not played by the same rules that once retaliating against them, law and order and democracy, therefore, doesn't matter anymore. See, if they can do this to us, we can do this to them. We have let go of forbearance and mutual toleration for the other side. It is no longer we disagree with you. It's that we demonize you and dehumanize you. This is when it goes from a political disagreement to one that is along the spiritual realm. A lot of evangelical Christians, for example, do not believe that Democrats just have a simple policy disagreement. Oh, no. They are devils, they are demons, and they need to be destroyed. Evangelicals, maybe others on the far right, believe that they are ordained by God to fight the forces of evil. This is a spiritual battle to them. And once you bring religion into it, it becomes very dangerous. Because if you believe you're ordained by God to oppose a side that you are convinced is evil, well, then it becomes very dangerous, doesn't it? You can dehumanize the other side. You have God on your side. And all your actions, no matter how irrational, illegal, or violent, can be passed off as legitimate. So, when we export jobs, we import terrorism. Specifically, domestic terrorism. I'm not talking about internationally, I'm talking about domestic it foments the working class. Since the early 90s, the rise of far-right terrorism has been on the rise ever since the 1995 Oklahoma bombing by Timothy McVeigh. These kind of people are in the military, these white supremacist, far-right political activists. They're in the military and they hide amongst us. In fact, there was a report that came out in 2011 that identified many white supremacists in the military. They'll go and they'll enlist in the military specifically and solely for explosives training. They go back in civilian life and they join militias. This becomes very dangerous. We see a rise of far-right terror. Well, why is it happening? Well, one, they believe that Democrats are not just policy difference, but screwing with their livelihoods, their work, their lives. And they believe that any means necessary is warranted to stop these people because they see them as truly evil and the enemies of the Republic. This has all been twisted. Number two, they don't realize that well, yes, justice, freedom isn't evenly distributed sometimes throughout, throughout a nation, throughout its people. The problem, though, is that they're willing to go to the same lengths, break the law by illegal and violent means to stop these elites. We've seen this with Donald Trump in 
2016, 2017, as he ran as a candidate for president. He said that some Mexicans, Mex Mexico is not sending their best. They're criminals, they're rapists. I assume some are good people. In 2017, he instituted his Muslim travel ban. He wanted to institute it until we, quote, figure out what the hell is going on. So, this has a history. It's working class rage, anger, fomented by the decimation of the working class by neoliberal policies, such as these this conventional wisdom on market economics, that there's infinite growth, that we can outsource jobs, that we can outsource cheap labor, that we can deregulate the market, that a market unencumbered by regulation is a more freer and prosperous market, and therefore those that are involved in it will be more free and prosperous nations. This is all neoliberal talking points, when really a lot of people are constrained by this. So then you add a straw, a straw man to this equation, and he can blame the immigrants for taking jobs. Well, guess what? The straw man is usually the far-right authoritarian. And guess what? He's cutting taxes for the rich. He's doing deregulation of the economic sector. He's doing bailouts for corporations in the financial sector. And he's going out the back door with all the money. Your ire should be against the rich corporations and the top 1%. I mean, look at ExxonMobil and all these fossil fuel companies. They benefit from millions of dollars of taxpayer-funded subsidies a year. The pharmaceutical industry. We pay for the research and development of pharmaceutical drugs. Yet we have a rapacious middleman that jacks up prices and makes it unaffordable to us, the consumer, when we paid for the drugs to be researched and made. All these kind of shenanigans go on. Not to mention the revolving door throughout Washington, where a FDA advisor, someone who is supposed to be the head of the FDA to approve pharmaceutical drugs for their safeness, effectiveness to the general public, was maybe once a head of Pfizer or head of another biotech pharmaceutical company. So with all these things in play, a strong man gets involved and he uses immigrants as a scapegoat. Well, guess what? Immigrants don't qualify for a lot of social services, uh, contrary to popular belief. They don't get WIC. They don't get food stamps. The only really government program they qualify for is TAMF, Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. Most of these require a social security card, which means you have to be a resident. Studies have shown that immigrants commit less crime than natural born citizens. Another study shows that it's not really illegal immigration that is causing the problem. Most quote unquote illegals are just legal Residents overstaying their visas. So the problem isn't immigration. These people aren't stealing your jobs. They're not taking jobs that anyone would want in the first place. Maybe, just maybe, blame the capitalist. I mean, if you love capitalism, then you have to concede that this is fair practice. Corporations, employers can pay whatever they want, even if it's wage slavery, right? Well, you can't say that corporations and people can pay whatever they want when people are trying to ask for a living wage and say, well, hey, just go in another, to another place to work. True, we will go to another place and the immigrants will be there waiting for the slave wages, the jobs that you don't want. 
because that's how capitalism works. So maybe, just maybe, the rich, greedy capitalists benefiting off slave wages and labor, cheap labor, and not adhering to the law are to blame. Most of these people are just coming across the border and they're trying to make a better life for themselves and their families. Sure, there's going to be criminals in any group, but to demonize all of them is wrong and factually incorrect. Most of these people are trying to find a better life for themselves and their family. Usually it's because war, we have a problem of violence against women, so much so that they termed it femicide in Honduras, one of the most violent countries in the world. A lot of this also has to do with foreign policy decisions that the United States has made against Central America and South America, as well as imperialism. People are escaping war-torn countries, violence, gains, violence against women, drug cartels. We talk about how these countries are so bad and how the U.S. is so much better. Yet when people escape to these countries, we don't welcome them like we do as they do in the Bible. And adhere to good Christian principles like accepting the sojourner, giving the shirt and coat off your back to those in need, hungry, tired, and poor. So, this is how strong men come to exploit divisions among working class. The working class angst and anger people feel against the elites. Is their anger warranted? I would say for the most part. But their anger is also misdirected. We agree on the problems. Leftists would say that, yes, global trade deals decimated the working class. Deals such as NAFTA and USMCA, <clears throat> uh, United States, Mexico, Canada agreement have the same provisions as NAFTA, uh, which Donald Trump um, was a supporter of. Um, so, maybe we need to just be aware of people trying to exploit class struggle. Because the real... This is not an ethnic struggle between Anglo-Saxon culture and the others that happen to be brown and black. And this fear of the white majority becoming the minority in 30 plus years. The real exploitation is between the haves and the have-nots. The middle class and the poor versus the rich. The elites which means cross party lines, Democrat and Republican. Let's not kid ourselves. None of these politicians that you worship are really in the same league. There's some that are progressive that I could say modestly fight for working class issues. But by and large, let's not kid ourselves. This is not a ethnic division. This is not a race division. This is a class division. <laughs>